There we go. Okay, and I uh, am here to introduce James Grimmelman, who is the Tesler Professor, Family Professor of Digital and Information Law at Cornell Tech and Cornell Law School. He is the author of the casebook, Internet Law, Cases and Problems, and he also is an author of over 50 scholarly articles and essays on digital copyright, content moderation, search engine regulation, online governance, privacy on social networks, and other topics in computer and internet law. He's also written articles aimed at the general public in places like Slate, Salon, Wired, Publishers Weekly, and he provides expert commentary for news media, including New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and All Things Considered. He's worked as a programmer for Microsoft, clerked for a federal appellate judge, um, and he holds a JD from Yale Law School and an AB in Computer Science from Harvard College. But before I knew any of these amazing credentials uh, about him, I was introduced to him uh, through a post he wrote for Understanding the Understanding AI Substack, where he used an illustration of um, AI-generated images of an Italian plumber from a video game that looked like Nintendo's Mario's. When I saw that, I knew that he would be able to convey information in a way that uh, all of us non-attorneys could understand. So further ado, I'm going to pass it on to James and have at it. Hello, and thank you for having me here. I always love uh, talking with uh, library audiences, like book people are my people. So let me just get my slides up. Yes, yeah, so I want to talk about whether generative AI applications infringe copyright. And this is based upon a paper called Talking About AI Generation, Copyright, and the Generative AI Supply Chain. I'm just going to interrupt you because we can see your whole everything, all your oh. whole screen, not just your slides. So you probably okay, don't want to see your schedule. Okay, let me try this again. Thank you. <laughs> There, is that better? That's fantastic. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Let me start again. This is based upon a paper that is forthcoming in the Journal of the Copyright Society of the USA with two of my outstanding graduate students, Catherine Lee and A. Fetter Cooper. So this is a very much shorter version. The full one it is almost 150 pages. Uh, this is really designed to be the like more general audience version that doesn't get into the obsessive footnoting that law professors seem to have to do professionally. So the context here is you probably heard about a lot of the lawsuits being filed by media companies against AI companies or by individual authors. So Sarah Silverman, is suing OpenAI, and New York Times is suing Microsoft and OpenAI, Getty Images, there are lawsuits against Google and all of these companies. And these are all copyright lawsuits on behalf of groups of plaintiffs who own copyrights and object to the ways in which these companies train on them. So these companies use uh, generative AI systems in order to make new articles or new images or text based upon their works and the copyright owners object to this. So the question that I want to pose and to talk through over the course of this is how should we think about the question of whether these generative AI applications infringe copyright. And I'll give you a couple of answers to this question and we'll see what they get right and what their limits are. So the first possible answer is obviously yes, that the way in which you make a generative AI system inherently has to work with training data. And the way in which it has to work with them clearly involves doing the kinds of things that copyright law prohibits. So if I want to put up copyright law in one very brief slide, it would be that 
original works of authorship are copyrightable. Original expression created by authors, it could be paintings, it could be poems, it could be digital art, it could be sculpture. Any creative work fixed in a tangible medium is copyrightable. Well, that includes absolutely everything that an AI is trained on. It has to be fixed in order to be used as training data. You can't just ingest it into a computer unless it is being digitized somehow. So that all of the things in which they train are likely the kinds of things that could be copyrighted. And once you have a copyright, you have the exclusive right to do a bunch of things, one of which is to reproduce the copyrighted work. You have the right to make more physical copies of a book. You have a right to put a painting on postcards to make more copies. And the way in which AI systems work is very inherently uh, copy creating. So take, for example, the way in which something like ChatGPT or Dolly are trained. These are systems made by OpenAI, which is one of the leaders in the AI industry. Well, they often start by going to something called Common Crawl. Common Crawl is an organization that makes a large snapshot of large parts of the web. If it's on a web page that you have browsed, it is likely available in the common crawl. They go out and they take copies of all of these things regularly. So you can get billions of pages, incredibly large amounts of data that contain tons of copyrighted works, all kinds of Times articles and blog posts and forum posts, all of that. That's in the common crawl. So then OpenAI takes these images, takes these texts, and feeds them into very large, complicated digital models on very large computer systems. Here is part of the Microsoft data center that it built for OpenAI to train these models. And these systems basically learn generalizations of what's in their training data. They say, here is one example. Here is one web page. Look at this page and learn some of the correlations be between words to learn that when you see the English word the, statistically, a noun is much more likely to follow it and a verb is much less likely to follow it. it learns these correlations and you expose it to each training data example. And these correlations get stronger and stronger. And then it can do things like predict the next word in a text or fill in images so that they're coherent and meet, not match whatever you're looking for. Well, when you have a system that can learn your training data this well, it is not very surprising that it's quite easy to get out as outputs things that strongly resemble the training data. Here are a bunch of examples from Dolly that show that the Banksy girl with balloon image, famous piece of street art, is present inside the training data. These are all outputs that users were able to get the model to make by asking for a girl with a heart-shaped balloon. These are examples where it's clear that the model has learned this copyrighted work and can generate what we would call derivative works of it. So that clearly is a prima facie copyright infringement. The model is a copy, and it makes more copies in these outputs. And models can also generalize from things like an artist's style. On the left, you have a bunch of animated illustrations by the illustrator Holly Mengert. On the right, you have the outputs of a visual model that were trained on her style. And it can produce things that, you know, Online artists will say that's actually terrible, doesn't have her good sense of composition and color, but they're recognizably in her style. There's no way that they could be unless they had been trained on her copyrighted works. So the case here is pretty straightforward. There are millions of copyrighted works in the training data sets that were made to use, used to make these models. There are copies in the outputs, which we can see. 
And there are copies in the models themselves that these companies have created. And all of these copies are infringing or perhaps I should say potentially infringing because the analysis does not stop once we show that there is a copy that resembles the work, the original copyrighted work. The counter argument that all of this is obviously infringing is that it's obviously not infringing because of fair use. And so I probably don't need to belabor the definition of fair use for a library audience, but just to remind everybody that fair use is a general purpose defense in the Copyright Act that allows uses of a work that would otherwise be infringing based upon balancing four factors, which include very importantly, the purpose and character of the use and the amount used. So fair use traditionally defends a wide range of uses. Let me show you a couple of common patterns that are relevant here. One of these patterns is what would come to be known as transformative fair use when the expression in a work is modified in some way to give it a new meaning or a new context. So these are the plaintiff's work and defendant's work from a case called Keynes versus Scani Nason. Man on the left is the mayor of a town who uh, got into a series of online scuffles with some of the residents over his attitude towards partying and in response, they made t-shirts of him and sold them at a block party. And he got the copyright for the photograph and sued them for copyright infringement. The court said that this use was protected by fair use because they took the expression in the photograph, the photographer's specific choices about lighting and timing and transformed it into something with a very different, very critical message. They changed what the work looked like and made it express something different. But changes in the physical details aren't even necessary. You can have cases where the outputs are pretty much the same, but the context is different. This is a photograph of a business named Nanan Katz, which was put up by a blogger to criticize him and make him look silly because he had his tongue out in the photograph. He bought the copyright of the photograph and sued the blogger. And the court said, the purpose of criticism here was served by using the full photograph. She was using it for a very different purpose. This is from Bill Graham Archive versus Drawing Kindersley. The publisher made an illustrated history of the Grateful Dead. The concert promoter that owned the copyright in some of the Grateful Dead posters you can see here on these pages sued for copyright infringement. And the court said, Putting these in this collage, this timeline, with lots of other material, text and timeline and illustrations, means that these small-scale reproductions were fair use overall. So these are all cases that involve what's called them artisanal human curation. They are transforming the authorship in these works into something new and something different. But there's also a line of cases that involve what we can call bulk technological uses, where computers do a lot of processing of the particular copyrighted works. So this is turnitin.com, plagiarism detection software. And the way that it works is it takes previous term papers that students have written that have been uploaded, and it compares the text in a student written paper to what's already in the database. And it looks for similarities. Some students sued saying that this use of their works was unfair because it involved making copies of their essays. And the court said, no, in essence, this comparison has nothing to do with why copyright exists. Students don't get an incentive to write term papers because they're going to be able to sell them to readers in, the, in a bookstore. They write term papers in, as, for a school assignment in order to learn. And checking those papers for infringement has nothing to do with reading the works to enjoy them. It is about doing an analysis to look for potentially plagiarized similarities. The extreme example of this kind of reasoning is the Google Books Project, where Google scanned millions of 
out of print in, but in copyright books in order to build a search engine. And the courts there, once they finally weighed in on the legality of the practice, held that this too was legal. That making a search engine is not the same as consuming the books to enjoy them. And it also enables new kinds of analyses. So the Google Books Ngram Viewer is a system that lets Google users see uh, how the usage of particular time terms has changed over time. Here you can see the steady rise of copyright over the course of the 20th century, really picking up after the passage of the 1976 Copyright Act. And then artificial intelligence has a boom and then dies back. And then more recently, machine learning has started to really surge. This is the kind of insight you can get by analyzing hundreds, thousands, millions of books all at once, which is very different from what you would see by analyzing one at a time. And so the court says this purpose helps justify the fair use of scanning the books. So the AI companies and their academic defenders put these together and say, you've got two transformative, two fair use approaches converging here. The outputs of a system are often transformative fair use. They are remixing and recombining the works they were trained on in interesting ways that make them provide new messages for the people who use them. And on the input side, building a training data corpus is a fair use in the same way that building the Google Books corpus might be. It's an input into a process that produces new insights but the process itself doesn't compete for audiences with the author. And as for the machine learning models, the systems that AI companies create, maybe they're both non-expressive and transformative. They certainly recombine works in new and surprising ways that produce really interesting new art. And they might be non-expressive too, because it's a technological process. We humans can't read machine learning models directly. They're uninterpretable to us. They're incredibly complicated. You have to use them to generate the outputs. So this is a pretty good argument, but I think it is not perfect. The problem is that I think it's the case that some outputs might well infringe. You can use a generative AI system in a way that would lead to an infringing output. Let me call your attention to this Banksy outputs again. These are user-generated images that quite plausibly infringe on the Banksy original in a way that is not uh, covered by fair use. And so we have a situation in which some of the outputs are not fair use. And if that's right, it means that transformative fair use is not enough by itself to protect all outputs. And the case for non-expressive use only really works when all of the outputs are protected or not infringing. But some of the outputs might well infringe. So here's another way of looking at this. Maybe some outputs infringe and some don't, but Surely we can say that if a user produces an infringing output, it's the user's responsibility. They're the ones who made it infringe. The AI company is just providing a service that is mostly used for good purposes. Well, this is an argument that has a nice and venerable history in copyright law. This is the argument that Sony won on when, we, when they were sued over the, the Betamax VCR. The VCR could be used by a home user in order to make an infringing copy by taping a movie off of the air and then selling that copy. But it could also be used in a non-infringing way. Maybe you tape Mr. Watt Rogers so you can watch it later with your kids or use it for home movies. And so the case went to the Supreme Court, which held that Sony couldn't be liable because even if some of its users used it to infringe, others used it for non-infringing purposes. 
So the AI companies would like to say that their AI systems are like a VCR. They might have some infringing uses, yes, but they also have non-infringing uses and we can't impose liability on the company if the device is capable of non-infringing use. But of course, this is not the last word in secondary liability and copyright. Napster, at the turn of the century, the music sharing service, tried to raise a Sony argument and say, yes, this device, this technology can be used to share infringing music, but it could also be used to share non-infringing music, and therefore Sony protects us. The courts rejected this argument because they said, well, Napster has ongoing control over the service. It can take down or prevent users from finding each other to exchange copyrighted works. And so it's fair to hold them to a higher standard than we held Sony, which made VCRs. Once Sony sells a VCR, it can't stand in your living room all the time seeing what you do with it. But Napster could look to see if you were searching for Madonna songs and then stop you from connecting with other users to download them if you matched. Napster could not successfully handle this burden. They were not equipped to do the kinds of filtering the courts expected of them, and they were sued into oblivion. But other services have successfully managed this, in part because of the notice and takedown regime in the Copyright Act. So Section 512 of the Copyright Act, passed as part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or if you want to be really precise, the Online Copyright Infringement Liability Limitation Act, the provider of a web-hosted service is not responsible for copyright infringement by user-uploaded materials, provided they respond to take down notices for infringing material. So Marvel and Disney can go to YouTube and look for infringing uploads of Avengers movies. And if they find one, they send a takedown notice to YouTube saying, this is actually copyrighted by us, take it down. And if YouTube promptly disables access to that video, YouTube is not liable for the infringement. This is a pretty widely relied upon part of the online legal structure at this point. And it's a kind of compromise between the interests of copyright owners and the interests of technology companies. The copyright owners do get a system to force takedowns of infringing uploads, but YouTube can continue to exist as long as it honors those takedowns. That means some infringement takes place, but there's a procedure by which copyright owners and technology companies and users negotiate the details in specific cases. It's not on YouTube to find and remove all infringing works preemptively. YouTube's responsibility is to respond once a copyright owner goes through the notice and takedown process to call a specific infringing work to its attention. So acting only when it receives notice. So we might ask, why not apply a notice and takedown process to generative AI. Why not say, okay, open AI when you run chat GPT. You only have to stop infringing generations of works in the style of Dr. Seuss if somebody sends you a notice saying this infringes on the copyrights held by the Seuss estate. The system works in a online hosting context but there are a bunch of problems that means it probably doesn't work as such for generative AI services. The first problem, the kind of thing that lawyers would point out uh, and others might gently mock them for, is that this isn't actually what the law says. The Copyright Act talks about material uploaded by users. That safe harbor doesn't really fit a generative AI service, whereas the AI company that ingested all of these copyrighted works to start with. They're the ones who made the choice to train on Banksy and on Holly Mengert and on Dr. Seuss and on all of the other authors whose works are included in their training data sets and models. So there's no statutory authority for such a system right now. 
And it's not easy to see how a court could find its way to recreating that whole system on its own. But even if we said to Congress, okay, amend the law to create notice and takedown for generative AI companies, it's probably not a system that's workable here. And the reason is that AI technology is much more complicated than your simple web hosting. And it's complicated in ways that make it hard to police. So on the one hand, copyright owners can't easily find infringing works. It's not like Banksy uh, or Holly Mengert can just go to Dolly or to Mid Journey and say, show me all of the works of mine that you've trained on. Show me all of the outputs that look like my works. They don't have a list. You can't just search them the way you search YouTube to find all of these, which means relying on copyright owners to send takedown notices gives them a much harder lift than they have in the context of online file hosting. The second problem is that once an AI company gets a notice, it's not that obvious how they can block infringing outputs. Sure, you tell them, okay, this output infringes on this input. But this isn't like YouTube where there's a straight line. There's one file on the server at one URL that YouTube can block access to. This is a case where the model has learned the features of that input work in very complicated ways. You can't just perform surgery on the model to go in and excise that one particular work. It's encoded in ways that are not scootable or easily findable. So the notice and takedown system winds up putting impossible burdens both on copyright owners and technology companies. So I could keep on adding details to this, proposing answers to whether it infringes or not. But I want to say that this is probably the wrong way to approach the problem. We should not expect the question of whether generative AI services infringe copyright to have a simple, clear answer. The reason for that is that copyright is not a system that has simple, clear answers to start with. Copyright law has always had a huge element of highly fact-specific issues. There are places in which it is simply not possible to give blanket answers without a lot of close attention to the works question issue. Here's one that I like to teach my students about. We have a long discussion about this one in class. On the left, you have a photograph of a hula dancer in the surf. And on the right, you have a stained glass image of a hula dancer on the sand. The copyright owner of the photograph sued the creator of the stained glass for copyright infringement. Now, at one level, it is obvious that the two works are very similar. There are similarities in the pose of the two dancers to the degree that it seems clear that the stained glass was created by using the photograph as a reference. But the fact that it was copied does not mean that there was infringement. To say that, we have to dive deeper into the details. For one thing, the copyist did not take all of the visual details in the photograph. It's not simply a reproduction of the photograph. It abstracts and simplifies the shape. It adds colors. It removes some elements like the mountain in the background entirely. So it doesn't copy everything that's in the work. In addition, not everything in the work is copyrightable. The pose was not created by the photographer. That's traditional in hula dancing. The lay that the dancer is wearing, falling across her in particular ways, those are traditional in hula dancing as well. The way that her hair falls and the surf splashes, the photographer didn't create those, nature did. And so the court goes through a lengthy several page analysis of all of these copyrightable and uncopyrightable elements, all of these similar and dissimilar elements, and comes to a conclusion that these two are not infringing. 
There is no way to do that without playing art critic of these two works. You have to engage with the specifics. Similarly, you can't get into a fair use analysis without knowing an awful lot about the specific works in question. Here is the famous Shepard Fairey uh, poster, Obama Hope. It turned out to be based upon an Associated Press photograph of Obama. Well, you can see the similarities, but the message conveyed by the poster is very different in some ways. Is it different enough to be transformative? Well, to know that, we'd have to know something about the election campaign in 2008 when this was created. We would know about Barack Obama's place in American history. We would need to know about a whole lot of context in order to even understand what these two works are doing. You can't automate that in a way that reduces to a simple legal rule. Well, it turns out that we're going to have similar problems with generative AI systems. For example, here are a pair of images from a paper showing that some image models memorize specific photographs in their inputs. The authors were able to find that this particular model had effectively memorized the photograph of Anne Graham Lutz. Well, it's memorized enough of the visual details to be a very similar image, but not identical. There's visual noise because the training process does not perfectly learn every detail of the specific input works. If it did, generative AI would not be generative. It would just be a search engine that gave you back whatever was in the training set. These things are interesting because they are creative. In some ways, this generation is a failure of what the system is supposed to do. It would be more interesting to give you a photograph of Ms. Lotz in a different setting, in different pose. So you have here imperfect partial memorization. Is that substantially similar to the photograph it was based on? We can't say without doing a full substantial similarity art critic analysis like we did for the hula dancer. Here is another example that we found while doing research for our article. These are outputs from mid-journey if I put in the prompt adventurous archaeologist. Now, the interesting thing about these images is I didn't say anything about Indiana Jones, and yet the outputs reflect specific visual characteristics from the Indiana Jones movies. You'll notice that he's gotten a whip, not standard part archaeological kit. He's wearing a hat that's associated with Indiana Jones. He is other elements of his costume from the shirt to the color scheme of the shoulder belt he is wearing in browns. This model has clearly learned the concept of Indiana Jones in a bunch of ways. This is not based upon resemblance to one specific image. This is not the Raiders of the Lost Ark poster. It's based upon a large number of representations of him in its training set in different ways. This is a very hard problem in idea and expression in copyright. We're going to have to actually do a bunch of copyright work to talk about whether this is learning only the idea of Indiana Jones or the specific expression of them in particular works. Similarly, people have shown that these models learn the visual styles of particular artists. So here are Dolly replicating the visual approach of famous photographers, Dorothy Lange. This is a question in copyright policy. To what extent is an artist's distinctive visual style protected, even if the particular defendant's work does not closely resemble any specific work that it was trained on? And finally, I want to add that the Supreme Court has recently scrambled this in ways that make it hard to get general answers out. The Andy Warhol go Foundation versus Goldsmith case decided this term really 
puts pressure on these approaches. So the backstory here is that Lynn Goldsmith, a photographer, took the photograph of Prince on the right for a magazine article. And then Condé Nast wanted to produce an article about Prince as a tribute. And they went to Andy Warhol and asked him to take to make a illustration. Goldsmith's photograph was provided to Warhol as an artist's reference, and it was licensed and paid for in that capacity. And they took one of the images, he produced the image of Prince, which ran with the article, and that was all fine, except that Warhol had made 20 prints uh, as part of this series. He had put, uh, given one image of them to Montanast, Nast, others remained in the collection. Eventually they were sold to collectors, and then when Prince died, Condé Nast came back to the foundation, asked to license the original image again. But they said, hey, we have this other, other ones in the same series of prints. Would you like to look at this print of prints? And they text like this orange one instead. Goldsmith sued. The case goes to the Supreme Court based on whether this is transformative fair use or not. And the Supreme Court holds that it was not transformative fair use. Uh, or rather remands for the court to consider it under a test that makes it fairly clear that it's not. And the part of the opinion I think is really relevant here is that the court emphasizes that fair use is use by use. It's not that this orange print of prints is necessarily fair use once and always will be or isn't, but rather it might be fair use when Andy Warhol makes it in his studio. That doesn't confirm or deny that it's fair use when Prince sells this one single edition print to a collector. And it doesn't tell us whether or not it's fair when that image is used as a cover for a tribute issue. Those are three separate uses. Well, that suggests that Making a model could be fair or unfair. It's an independent question from whether any particular output is fair or unfair when the model produces the output, which is a different question from whether that use is fair or unfair when used. I could imagine that it is entirely fair use for me to show you those Indiana Jones outputs or the Dorothy Lange outputs, maybe not for me to sell them. Maybe the Holly Mengert illustrations, style illustrations are fair use when produced by a fan for their own enjoyment, but not fair use if they're sold as commercial prints. And if that's right, then we have to know about the specific downstream uses that users make in order to know whether these training systems will be fair use or not. And another complicating fact is we can't easily say that a given infringing output is the responsibility of the user or the company, definitively. There are going to be a lot of contextual factors. So let me tell you three different stories about a model that's been trained on a lot of Disney animated movies. And I think they're going to raise different instincts about which uses are fair, unfair, or whose responsibility these are. So one possibility is the user goes in and types, Anna and Elsa. And this is a case where the user wants a photograph or wants an animated picture of two specific characters. A general purpose image model, something like OpenAI's uh, Dolly or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, might well respond with an image of these two Disney princesses. This seems like a case where you have a general purpose model and the user is the one who asked it to produce something resembling a specific copyrighted work. That's on the user. Or what if you get the same output from a model where the user types an ice princess and the model's idea of an ice princess looks like Elsa? That's a case where the similarity seems to be coming from the model, from the company that's providing it. The user is open to a wide variety of expressions. The company is the one that is zoomed in on something that is very specific to Disney. Third variation, the user types in Watch Frozen 2. The model is one that has been trained exclusively on Disney animated movies, and it responds by starting Frozen 2 playing. 
That is a case where the user and the company are in cahoots. The company has provided something to let the user watch Frozen 2 without paying for it. That's a case where there are co-conspirators in this process of infringement. In order to know what any given scenario looks like, we have to ask questions about the user, the company, the model, and the use. So I want to say, to summarize this part of the presentation, that there are very real copyright issues here, but also very good defenses by the AI companies and their users. I don't think we can say that all uses of generative AI are infringing, and I don't think we can say that all uses are not infringing. The best that we can say is that some uses infringe and some don't, and the line between the two of them is as complex here as it is anywhere else in copyright. Copyright law has relied on humans making careful comparisons of works and their contexts for a long time. We're going to have to keep on doing that for a long time, even with generative AI. So I want to conclude by zooming out and asking, where does this put us in the history of the copyright system? Because I have been talking about about copyright infringement by generative models. When they are used in these ways, do they cause infringement? But the other question we can ask about them is the authorship question. When they are used in these ways, do they create copyrightable outputs? So here is an example of a work that's been controversial. This is Zarya of the Dawn, a graphic novel written by Krish Kashtanova and illustrated using uh, illustrations generated by Kashtanova using Midjourn. They sent this to the Copyright Office, got a registration, and then the Copyright Office found out from publicity that Kashtanova had used Midjourney to generate the images. The Copyright Office re-examined the application and concluded that the individual images were uncopyrightable because they were not the product of human authorship. But the graphic novel as a whole, with the captions and dialogue, might be copyrightable as a work of human authorship, drawing a sharp line between human authors and the contributions of the AI. This is a very big question. And it's not clear how our current copyright system, which is based upon works of human authors, should deal with this. A Chinese court recently found that an AI-generated work was copyrightable, although in that case, it leaned heavily on the fact that the user had very carefully crafted a specific prompt and gone through a lot of work to generate a work using those details. I want to suggest that this is larger even than the question of whether generative AI fits into the definition of an author. We might be on the brink of a really large transformation in copyright. And the reason I say that is the last technology I can think of that had this much of an impact on the copyright system was the printing press. Before the printing press, you basically have a system of patronage or sponsorship. Authors are people who can finance their own life works by investing the time, or they are supported by a patron who gives them money to have the time or sometimes to encourage them to work on a particular topic. They print their works by having them hand copied in small editions that are passed around. The printing press changes this. It doesn't make writing any easier. But what it does is it makes the, the expense of making many copies much cheaper. It enables mass reproduction. And with mass reproduction, you have a new business model. You can make lots of copies and sell them to the public. Each copy is cheap to produce, much cheaper than writing a new book. And so therefore you have a business model in which the author incurs the high fixed cost of spending time writing a book but then can sell lots of copies that are made produced cheaply and sell enough copies to the public to support their work. This new business model is, however, vulnerable to other people with their own printing presses who can take their book, retypeset it, and then distribute that to the public. That's a system 
that generates a need for copyright law. Copyright law prohibits the second printer from coming in and undercutting the first printer. Well, the copyright system takes about a century and a half after the printing press to arrive. Copyright law is a response to this huge shift, made a new business model possible, and that business model was made possible because the cost of reproduction of copying went from high to low. Generative AI drives the cost of creation down. You can put into mid-journey something like adventurous archaeologist and get out one of those images I showed you earlier. That's an enormously easier task than generating those pictures from scratch would have been. It's driving the cost of writing, of illustrating down. And we might say that these versions aren't as good as what's produced artisanally by humans who have more artistic judgment, but there's still going to be an awful lot of it kicking around. We are moving from a world in which creation is expensive and copying is cheap into a world in which both creation and copying are cheap. It's quite possible that the legal system that makes sense for that world will be as different from copyright as copyright was from what came before it. That's my talk. I would be happy to take your questions now. Yep. Thank you very much, James. Um, we do have a few questions already in q and I don't know if you can see those, but um, all right, then you can go ahead. So let me start. Uh, number, the first one, fair use protects humans who use copyrighted work. Does it also cover machines? Isn't there something fundamentally different about how a human consumes, produces, and outputs content from how a machine does show? Maybe fair use shouldn't apply to machines. Yes, I think that this is a absolutely key issue that lies at the heart of these debates. I have an article from about a decade ago called Copyright for Literate Robots, in which I point out that a lot of these technological cases are based upon the idea that computers do these things that are basically not reading in the sense that the, that the market is reserved for humans. Selling copies to humans is the thing copyright exists for. Um, if the uh, copyright system, however, wants to encourage these kinds of non-expressive uses, it should make them fair use. You're expressing the opposite instinct. Maybe fair use shouldn't apply here because they're not serving the same goals as humans. I think it's a perfectly fair argument. Certainly the AI industry has been having to have this, trying to have this both ways. They have argued, for example, both that I as a human am allowed to read whatever I want. Reading is not an act of infringement. I should be allowed to use a machine to read for me. So they're emphasizing that I want to actually be able to use a human and a machine as substitutes. But then they also say, eh, if it's just a machine doing the reading, it doesn't count. All of this ingestion, all this copying by AI models, that's not really reading like a human would. Therefore, it shouldn't be infringement. So there are just very complicated, uh, very like arguments that can be run on both sides in both directions here. Next question I see is, is monetization of the output the linchpin for infringement? It used to be under the 1970, 1909 Copyright Act, monetization was explicitly part of the test for some of the rights. So public performance for profit was infringement, nonprofit private performances were not. It's not part of the infringement test now. The rights don't explicitly distinguish between commercial and non-commercial uses. Instead, the uh, test for fair use partly incorporates uh, the continued commerciality. Courts address it under the first factor in terms of commercial and non-commercial uses, and they also address it under the fourth factor in terms of effect on the copyright owner's market. So there's not a bright line rule here. We don't say all non-commercial uses are fine. 
and all commercial uses are not. Some commercial uses are fair, some non-commercial uses are unfair. It's just one part of the larger analysis. Question is, doesn't training models with copyright material inevitably involve copying intellectual property? Why shouldn't AI companies be expected to license this material for their data sets, which they can then offer the public who could input prompts? So that's certainly the perspective that media companies and publishers take on this. We have put great effort into developing these. We have supporting artists with their careers by making these works. They are supported by sale to the public. If you are making a use of this that generates value, why shouldn't some of that go back to the authors and publishers in the form of a licensing fee? The AI companies generally would respond to that by saying one of two things. One of them is that not every valuable use of IP or copyright is compensated. There are plenty of circumstances in which we allow people to use works that don't really result in licensing revenue. So for example, web search engines, in a sense, rely upon lots of work with copyrighted works in order to direct people to where those works are. To, you, have to, you have to read a web page and analyze it. You need to look at the contents. That involves making copies. It's a commercial process. But Google does not pay license fees to every website that it calls. Instead, the courts have said, this kind of indexing, making a search engine is a fair use because it serves a valuable function. Which of these principles we should apply to generative AI is a complicated and controversial question. It's a policy question rather than one we can get out simply from the text of the Copyright Act. And then I see, next question is, many AI tools will differentiate text to adjust reading levels. Is using this breaking copyright? This is a very hard question too, um, because you can write a lot of analogies in terms of what the ways in which an AI tool is, works is doing. One analogy you could write would be that this is like a Cliff's Notes or Spark Notes version of a book. And they have taken that book and explained it, but done so in a way that helped people study it. And there's a good fair use case for this kind of critical annotation or aid on something. There are books that are so complicated, they have their own companion books written by others to tell you how to read them. This is the Gravity's Rainbow Companion that goes through in exhaustive detail, explaining every reference and jo running joke that Thomas Pynchon makes in the course of the novel. Another approach would be, you know, this is like the Harry Potter lexicon, a derivative work made by a Harry Potter fan describing who all of the characters and spells and incidents in the books are. The court there says this is not fair use, uh, and therefore it is... Uh, infringing because it copies too much from the source. You could easily analyze generative AI's treatment of a work to either of these. When you take the text and you modify it for different audiences, or you create an interactive app that lets you ask questions of a scientific paper, those kinds of uses can make a transformative argument, but it's not obvious in general that all those transformative arguments come out yes or no. And I see, what will the generative AI landscape, long landscape look like in 10 years? Uh, 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 I don't know. I think in two years, it will likely look a lot like it looks now. There may be some more answers in copyright from the cases that are currently ongoing. There might be some cases about liability for incorrect outputs. There might be a bit more about some of the other IP issues, but I don't know what's going to happen after that, in part because I don't know where generative AI is going. The 
changes in the advances in capacity of what these systems can do over the last five years has been astonishing. The pace of improvement just in the last half decade has been unbelievable. I would not have predicted five years ago we would have tools at the level of GPT. And yet here we are. Will we, will we, have we had a plateau? Will things stabilize here? If that's the case, I expect we'll get some licensing deals and things that look pretty similar to how they are. But if we get two more five-year spurts at the degree of change we've had in the last, or if it goes even faster, I have no idea what the capability of the systems will be. And that may induce very substantial, very rapid legal change. Okay, I see other question. Oh, I guess that's part of the previous question I was answering. Any other questions that I can answer? Ah, would asking the AI models to be more transparent about their data sets assist the process, training the tools to cite the sources it used? So I think there are two things here we could ask for. One of them is simply getting the companies to open up more about their training data sets. I think that would be an extremely good thing. The companies mostly cite trade secrecy for not revealing what data they trained on. They want to keep their training data sets secret from their competitors. Other people can't make good models. But I think that's not a great reason in the face of public policy here. And the European Union's AI Act, in fact, is going to require uh, companies to disclose more about what's in the data sets they train on. I think this is a good thing. It helps copyright owners find out when their works have been implicated. It helps regulators understand what scope of data is being used. And it helps people know when there might be privacy risks from this training. The second thing that this model could be asking for would be having the AI model itself explain what sources it's relying on in a particular answer. This is called uh, attribution in the technical literature, or sometimes it's called, you have cases of retrieval augmented generation. The idea there is you're trying to say, I want this output to be based upon particular inputs and tell me which inputs they are used. This is a very active area of research and a lot of companies are working very hard trying to get their models to produce clear grounded answers that cite specific sources. I don't know if it's at the point where we can legally require this to be the case, but certainly the case, this is where companies are trying to go in terms of developing better models. Because sometimes you want very fanciful, imaginative outputs that are different from anything you've seen before. But sometimes you want very grounded inputs that tell you, this is where I got this information. This is what it says. People who are working on generative AI for law, for example, really want it to be grounded. You don't want your tool to hallucinate the authorities you're citing in your brief. Oh, great. Thank you so much, James. I just put in the chat, one of our school librarians had shared a link to um, an answer from our Ask the Lawyer service. We have Ooh, a lawyer that answers okay. library related um, issues. So you can look at that later and see if the two of you attorneys agree on, on yeah, leveling. I'll look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. On leveling the copyright issues around leveling for reading levels. But that was wonderful. I think, I mean, obviously you didn't answer our questions because so many questions are not able to be answered right now. So um, I think this puts us in a good place to know where to go forward the way things are now. We'll probably come back to you in two years to do that updated webinar. Um, for those of you attending, I put in the link to a form to get a CE certificate for today and a link to an evaluation. Um, in that evaluation, that's also where you can put in ideas for uh, future programs. There's also a link to our CDLC event calendar. There's lots of things coming up, um, including our in-person annual meeting, which is happening on April 26th, and Kathy Sheehan, uh, the Rensselaer County historian, is going to be talking about unusual uses of their records, including um, for the Gilded Age TV series and for solving cold cases by the police. So we invite you all to come to that on April 26th. And 
Related to this program, on June 6th, there's going to be a panel of our members on how their libraries are using AI right now. Um, you, that's open for registration. We don't have a great, uh, we don't have all the description out yet, but that's going to be on June 6th, and that will be a webinar as well. So I see lots of uh, comments saying that this was outstanding and fantastic. Um, Yes, no hallucination in legal answers someone put in the, in the chat. So uh, we thank you very, very much for sharing all your knowledge. And I will be sending out um, the recording and the slides, if James will share them with me, uh, to you all, as well as some links to his more in-depth articles for those of you who want to read the 150 pages to get into the nitty gritty. And um, we will see you all at a future program. Okay, great, thank you.